This is Ed White, and uh, before before we really started here, I was uh, thinking for a for a program on desire. He was really the essential guest. Um, I mean, he's a witness to the original sexual revolution and a participant, and over almost uh, thirty books. And I, when I counted up the books, also I realized I wasn't including plays. You know, oh yeah, there's anthology. And anthologies, yeah. So there's everything here. Um, but over the course of these 30 books and the plays also, desire really is the central theme um, that he's worked with. Um, and what I thought was cool is that now we can look at that over fairly deep time. Um, a Boy's Own Story was the first volume in a... a, a series of autobiographical works that I think anticipated what has now come to be called autofiction. Um, and uh, uh, these, uh, the books, the first one I read was A Boy's Own Story, and I think that was sort of the, the real standout um, of your early career. Um, it was a book that you know, to people of my generation, sort of just explained our lives in a way that we weren't, we were kind of anticipating but hadn't really sort of gained the words ourselves. Uh, I think with a lot of really, really original works, uh, you know, there's, there's a sort of boy's own story hole in society that's sitting there waiting to be filled. And when it comes along, that experience is one of just relief and uh, recognition and happiness, and that was certainly the way I greeted uh, a boy's own story. And it was already a long time ago. Um, and now uh, I know Michael Carroll has been working on a, a graphic novel version of a boy's own story. So it's kind of going full cycle from you know the beginnings of autofiction to the beginnings of uh, graphic novels. Um, and what about the, I was going to start and just ask you, what about the, uh, the change of the content, the central uh, theme of desire in there and sort of? You know, oddly enough, I don't think it's really evolved very much mm -hmm. because I think I'm still on hot coals of desire as I was when I was 22. I mean, I, I, I think I fall harder in love now than I ever did, and I suffer more from love. And I think the function of love is to suffer, uh, especially for writers. And, uh, and I'm still doing it. <laughs> I just came from my shrink's appointment. Uh, how'd that go? <laughs> Lots of crying. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, yeah. But that already, that's a big change, though, because, you know, the early, these autobiographical books, or the early ones, were a lot about conflict over... Psycho, psychoanalysis, because back then they were, of course, trying to cure you. Yeah, make you go straight. Yeah. And I had a very wacky psychoanalyst, the first one, whom I talk about in Boy's Own Story, and who uh, had an enormous log out in the backyard, one saying dad and one saying mom, and we were supposed to go out with a hatchet <laughs> and hit them, and that was supposed to cure us. And then he uh, thought I should go out with a, a girl patient of his who was anorectic and quite crazy and always on uh, feeding tubes in the hospital. And then she was afraid she might have gained an ounce, she was, so she would run up and down like 30 flights of stairs. <laughs> anyway, that was part of my cure. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. I, uh, but I was engaged twice to these Poor ladies, and uh, but who are still great friends of mine. And mm -hmm. One of them died, and the other they they became great friends of each other. Mm -hmm. Marilyn, and Marilyn, yeah, yeah and uh, Sigrid, mm -hmm. and um, I don't know, uh, but it's true that all my early analysis was with shrinks who thought there was only one thing to do, and that was to cure you of your homosexuality. Though no one had ever been cured. Right, yeah. And did they even offer drugs at some point? Or someone brought that up and... 
I don't remember that so You know, much. desire suppressing drug? Oh, maybe. You know, like the kind they give out in prisons? Uh, no, I no. didn't get Good. that. Because I think they wanted to uh, soak you for everything you were worth, which possible. is much better in talk therapy, which doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. I was actually going to ask you something a little bit along those lines. You said um, that you suffer more from love now than you ever have. And I was, you know, taking a look at your your whole career, and I always thought, oh, he's always, like, so full of these novelties that I've never thought of or novelties that I've never observed. And very often it seems like a kind of contrarianism, which people, th which is actually, you know, something of a shallow characteristic. But in your case, I think it's very deep, and I think it's very deeply felt, and it's a, a it's more than contrarianism. It's really the way you exist in the world. Um, something I noticed uh, along those lines was that a lot of the books that you wrote in your youth, like um, Caracol is the one I'm thinking of right now, um, which is the, uh, an early fantasy about uh, a sort of criminal uh, culture. Um, uh, there were characters portrayed that have this very wintry uh, sexuality, this sort of uh, jaded, disabused character uh, about sort of their loves and their desires. And uh, then I was noticing that recently, just as you say, in books like uh, My Master or stories like My Master, and, and then this book too, especially this book, which is the most recent one, the one that's coming right out, um, this is the sexuality, the desire is almost desperate. And I thought, oh, that's such a uh, rare change for anyone to experience life like that, to go from, you know, sort of impersonating a sort of super sophisticate to just becoming more and more and more raw as they go along. It's like that, that story by, who is it? Well, Andrew John Greer, uh, where the, somebody gets younger and younger the older he gets. And so he ends up a baby. He, end, he begins as an old man. <laughs> and I think there was a story like that by... Benjamin Button. Or Benjamin, Benjamin Button. Button. Who, who's that by? Uh, Fitz Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, I guess uh, that's a, <laughs> a, a kind of unbecoming plague is to start off as an old man and very... I mean, like John Ashbery wrote a blurb for my first published book in which he said, this is almost terminally sophisticated. <laughs> and, uh, and, and now I'm the height of naivety. <laughs> yeah. um, but I'd like to talk a little bit more about like sort of how you actually experience desire. I mean, it's... Um it's, it, you definitely are never indifferent to it or cool to it, but a lot of the talk at this seminar has been about fulfillment or satisfaction sort of being the enemy of desire. And yet, uh, that sort of makes us think that desire is this obvious thing, that we experience it and then we go, we take care of it, and then we start over again with something new, a new desire. But sometimes desires just are something we live with our whole lives, and they're never truly satisfied we never arrive at that at at a point even sort of enough fulfillment to to eradicate the desire and whether that's through self repression or or inhibition or fear uh there was uh in the beautiful room is empty is the second of these autobiographical novels um that you wrote uh and there's this absolutely beautiful quotation as its epigraph from a letter uh, Kafka wrote to Milena Jesenka. And I would just wanted to read it because it's, this, it's always stuck with me from the moment I read it in Paris to now. And I've sort of, it's not sort of the most beautiful, flowery epigraph in the world. It's really very much this, this genius trying to explain a very particular experience uh, uh, 
And he does so with this wonderful metaphor. Sometimes I have the feeling that we're in one room with two opposite doors, and each of us holds the handle of one door. One of us flicks an eyelash, and the other is already behind his door. And now the first one has but to utter a word, and immediately the second one has closed his door behind him and can no longer be seen. He's sure to open the door again, for it's a room which perhaps one cannot leave. If only the first one were not precisely like the second, if he were calm, if he would only pretend not to look at the other, if he slowly set the room in order as though it were a room like any other, but instead he does exactly the same as the other at his door. Sometimes even both are behind the doors and the beautiful room is empty. I think that's an interesting passage. But I think one of the things that uh, a good distinction to be made is between love and desire. Because I think, uh, I think a lot of people who are in love would be content to live with the beloved in a sexless relationship as long as the beloved didn't have sex with somebody else. I mean, I, th I think that the, the problem is that if you feel the beloved will leave you or love somebody else more than you, or, uh, and of course, New Yorkers try to pretend that they're not jealous, but I think without jealousy, there's no love. And uh, anyway, I, but I, I do think there's a real distinction between desire and love. And I do think many people would make their bargain with the devil that if the beloved would would always be in love with us, that we would that we would forego all sex with anybody. Hmm. But I'm kind of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just de it's definitely your subject, but I don't get the sense that you would give up sex that easily. Well, I do like it, but uh, uh, you know, I uh, although I think it's oops, I'm sorry. There you go. Uh, I do like it, but I think it's sort of unbecoming for to somebody my age. But anyway, uh, I, I I keep at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, it's very much a live part of your life. So, um, I wanted to talk also a little bit about you know now we can look sort of at your whole career, and uh, it's really quite extraordinary. I mentioned earlier on that. Uh, that you sort of tried your hand at everything. Uh, there's biographies, really great biographies, a biography of Genet. Um, there are books of essays, anthologies, as you mentioned, and, uh, um, and uh, the plays. Uh, I adore the plays. Um, but one constant sort of alteration that I've noticed, uh, especially in uh, books of fiction, uh, or memoir fiction, like the, the ones that I'm claiming are sort of auto-fictions, uh, uh, you often shift uh, between these fantastical fictions, uh, just wildly inventive, elaborate, broke, and, and then this ultra-vivid kind of naturalism in the m memoir work. Um, and in those, it seems like that, that incredibly active imagination is folded up into the uh, metaphors of the sentences, you know, like uh, like those extra dimensions in spring theory, string theory or something. And what I wanted to uh, ask is, what does that, what does going back and forth like that, what does that represent? And uh, well, you get uh, t t twice as much for your money. But also, no. But the other thing is that I think I oftentimes try out. A a plot or or a real life situation in the fantasy version first. So, so like Nocturnes for the King of Naples uh, precedes uh, a, a, a boy's own story. And uh, where in both cases I deal with a father and the complicated semi-erotic relationship between the father and son. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think that uh, with Car Caracol, I was, I had just moved to Europe where I lived in Paris, uh, where you lived too, for 16 years. 
And, uh, and I was reading th books in every language, and I said Caracol was like a bad dream that you might have on the eve of your, uh, of your uh, ex exam in comp lit. <laughs> and <laughs> because it, it draws from so many different sources and uh, it, it's my biggest flop, I think, that nobody liked it. Uh, because I, the weird thing is that once I was considered a gay writer, then gays would feel betrayed if I didn't write a gay novel. And uh, you know, and in Caracol, I don't think there are any gay characters. And in Forgetting Elena, there ba barely are. Right. And uh, so, and in this one, everybody's polyamorous. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think you know because there's a, a part of the bookstore that says gay book, and if you're not one of those, then they don't know where to file you. And uh, so, anyway, I, I don't complain because. Everything in America is niche marketing, mm -hmm. and at least that I had a niche for a while. Well, that's something actually that's been coming up again and again, and that is, you know, who's authorized to write a certain story? And you were sort of there at the foundation of, of the gay identity in a lot of senses, at least the, the modern one. And now you sort of you don't hold to it quite so firmly as you did back then. I mean, what was so impressive early on in your career, I think, was that you decided to be gay. I yeah, mean, to like, really gay to write The Joy of Gay Sex, to really just take a huge risk. <laughs> and, you know, like, because at that time, everybody, was, you know, every writer was, well, I don't think of myself as gay. I'm a, I'm a writer who just happens to be, I'm mostly yeah. a writer who just <laughs> happens to be gay. And... Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, you know? and so I just thought that was so bold, and yet through that, you know, approaching directly who you were, you did transcend it in many ways more than a lot of these other more squeamish writers. Well, and I I do think go, going back to the theme of who can write what, I think everybody should be able to write everything, mm -hmm. and I think like some of the best gay novels are by Iris Murdoch. Mm -hmm. who was neither a man nor gay. Right. I think she might have been a little bit gay, but she was married, and her husband might have been a little bit gay. Mm -hmm. But anyway, 10% uh, gay. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, I do, I do think, like, uh, um, James Baldwin's uh, Joe Bunny's Room is a really beautiful... Uh, beautifully written a uh, love story and yet all the characters are white one of the, the main one is italian and i mean come on you're not italian you're black <laughs> and you're american you can't write about that which is so foolish right yeah yeah i think what um uh eileen and colin touched on was that you know, sometimes you read a book by someone who's impersonating a character and it's just so wildly wrong that you, your reaction, which is really just criticism, you end up wanting to sort of forbid it, you know, which of course you really can't do. An example, though, of a sort of brilliant impersonation is uh, uh, Nabokov, you know, was able to cre create this hysterical both somewhat mocking yet extremely vivid gay character. Um, well, Nabokov, who was 100% straight, was uh, his brother was gay and his uncle was gay. And uh, he, he felt that homosexuality was genetic. And so he was quite worried about himself, but he needn't have been. But uh, anyway, uh, anyway, I think that... Uh, in Pale Fire, he created the great gay comic novel. I, I mean, I wrote an essay arguing that it was the best gay comic novel ever written. And it really is hilarious because, for instance, some, the, the, the king of Zimbla, who is a completely wacky character in a made-up country, uh, is, is being conducted out of the palace by a, a hot young man and though he has no time to change clothes 
in one instant he's wearing a bikini, and in the next he's wearing a lion skin, and the next he's naked. And it's all just be because uh, Nabokov was going through the catalog of all the hot gay looks of that time, uh, just as in Billy Collins' poem about Victoria's Secret, he was going through all the hot corsets of the day. Okay. I love that poem. We talked a little bit about this, but uh, about the sort of variation between more fantastic and uh, more naturalistic work, and that you sort of experiment with plots in, in fantasy that you then follow up uh, in a more naturalistic form. But recently, sort of the, your novels, seem, the most recent ones, the, for a little while now, have seemed to have these ingenious plots that you start with that before anything else. I always thought that was real writing, to write a mm -hmm. novel that had a plot mm -hmm. and that wasn't your life. Uh, but, and so, but I didn't know how to do that, so I only wrote about my life, which seemed pretty weird enough to hold people's interest. Mm -hmm. but, um, but I think that it's true that like my last several novels, one, one is a, uh, called Hotel de Dream, and it's, ab it's about... Uh, Henry James. There's a Henry James character, and uh, the... The main one is... Oh, uh, Stephen Crane. Stephen Crane, yeah. It, the main character is Stephen Crane, who uh, who uh, was brought up by a Presbyterian minister, and had a, and hated that background, and decided to be a kind of wild man, and he uh, was a reporter, and his favorite subject was writing about female prostitutes, but then one day he was returning from a concert, and a boy approached him. And the boy was painted and very skinny, probably tubercular. And he was uh, a, a, a beggar, but but a gay prostitute, male prostitute. And so uh, in my imagination, Stephen Crane, who had already written Maggie Girl of the Streets about a, a girl prostitute, I have him deciding that he wants to write about a boy prostitute, but that his best friend who's a kind of hairy-chested uh, author from Wisconsin, tells him, if you write this book, it'll ruin your entire career. So uh, anyway, eventually, it's, it, it's kind of written, but it's destroyed. And uh, and so the, that was fun for me, to make up the novel that, that Stephen Crane might have written ha had he really written that book and it not been destroyed. And then, uh, so it was kind of a little bit of literary history. I was a fellow at the Cullman Center, the 42nd Street Library in New York that year that I wrote it. And everybody else was gossiping the whole time. but And I was too gossiping, but I wrote chapter one the first day and I wrote the end the last day. <laughs> and uh, I, I think I'm the only one who managed to do any work. But... Uh, Anyway, uh, it was great because I had all these books to research and wonderful librarians who would look, I think librarians are the best thing in the world after operatic tenors. <laughs> and I think it, I'd like, in my next life, I'd like to be either a tenor or uh, a, a librarian. But anyway, um, the. These guys, these ladies and guys were so great because they would uh, manage to uh, find anything I wanted. Like, uh, I found out the first gay bar in New York was called The Slide, and it was on Bleecker Street, and that it still exists now as a, called Kenny's Hideaway. And, uh, and the, the librarians found me a wonderful microfiche about a raid on that first gay bar at, in the 1880s. And, you know, I gobbled up the, the... Because what's hard to do when you're writing, especially about gay life, which was so verboten, is to imagine what their speech was like and what their dress was like and what their attitudes were. And uh, so I read autobiographies of early gay people 
like 1900, but and then tried to project it into the past. But anyway, it was a lot of fun and a lot of research. And then uh, I wrote a book called A Saint from Texas. And I'm, I've always been an atheist, but I'm what I call a mystical atheist. That is, I love religion, but I'm not, I, I can't believe. So uh, anyway, I, uh, I thought it'd be fun to write a book about a saint. And, uh, and, 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 and it's not mocking. Like a, a friend of mine, Alfred Korn, said, this is so cruel that you wrote this book mocking these poor Catholics and it's the only thing they have in their life. And I, I said, it's not mocking them. I mean, I'm trying to be a saint in, or imagine what it would like to be a saint. Anyway, uh, I think it, he was the only one who felt that it was mockery because I, I think most people felt it was very pious, and uh, and it's about twin sisters from Texas in the fifties, and one of them becomes a French baroness because she's very rich, and the other one becomes a nun in South America because she endows the nunnery. Anyway, they uh, they both use their money to advance their careers, <laughs> and uh, that was fun to write because it was entirely imagined. Although I am a Texan, so that part wasn't imagined. And then the, uh, the, this book, A Previous Life, is um, about a, a married couple, an American wife, and her much older Sicilian husband, who uh, decide that their earlier marriages were botched because they were too transparent. And so they decide not to talk about the past at all. But when they feel comfortable with each other, which is when this book begins, they decide to write their autobiographies for each other and read them to each other and then throw them into the flames, not keep them. And uh, because it's a book for only one reader. And, uh, and, and so it, it traces all these fa fantastic, weird stories of, of both of them and, uh, and and it, that was great fun to, for me to write. It's also great because it sort of synthesizes those two styles. I mean, it does have this very clockwork sort of plot, but it's got, uh, you know, sort of immediacy of memoir in a lot of it. Do you, do you want to read some for us? Yeah, I'll just read a page at random. Sure, yeah. Uh, this is the... Uh, the um, Sicilian nobleman. And then we'll take some questions afterwards. I loved the classics because it was a taste I shared with my cultured grandfather and as a rejection of my playboy father, feather-brained father, as I imagined him. Not until my early 20s, when I was living in London, did I learn the word nerd, which I felt had perfectly described me as a teenager, bookish, well-mannered, talented in so many ways, languages, composing and performing music, a bit snobbish, my understanding rapid, and my memory vast and exact, not the usual narrow focus culture nerd, but a weightlifter and a whiz in math and physics. I was a nerd also because I hated pop music, even though a cousin of mine sang in an Italian boy band, The Plastic Boys, and played to huge audiences of teeny boppers. Their hit was Mi Piace, Il Tuo Corpo. I hated soccer. I, I avoided politics. I didn't know how to dance. I didn't have a car until I was 20, which at that time was a red antique cinquecento. I wasn't a beach rat. I could speak Sicilian, of course, but spoke Tuscan most of the time. I never sat around the cafes. In fact, I had a horror of cafes beyond standing at the zinc bar and downing a quick espresso. The idea of sprawling at a table for hours and eating panini and reading the pink sports pages or debating loudly with friends about government corruption, that life seemed to me so squalid. You could say I was proud to be a nerd once I knew what it was. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah.
Uh, now we can take some questions, I guess, if, uh, you know, there's someone. How could there possibly be a question after that? But <laughs> I always usually plant a, a question in the audience <laughs> because nobody can think what to ask. No. Well. Well, I'll ask one more question then, and that is, uh, you don't, um, you haven't had to address this for a really long time, but uh, uh, Alfred Korn's criticism reminded me of it, and that is, early on, you used to be sort of the most feared man in New York because you would do, you would include these sort of absolutely acid portraits of people, and people have completely forgotten that you had that reputation. Um, and I guess you've mellowed somewhat. But it always struck me that that kind of, uh, that critique that you were able to put into some of those sketches meant there was a, uh, the undercurrent of a moralist in you, which is sort of antithetical to what your career has been. But I wondered, what about morality and moralism? Oh, I think of that a lot, you know. And, uh, uh, and I think that, What's important in life is not morality, if that means sexual morality, which is silly, but it, it, it should mean ethics, like really treating other human beings as you would want to be treated. And uh, I, uh, I was very pleased to hear uh, in a debate yesterday that somebody said that they loved uh, Flannery O'Connor but that she never liked anyone, any character that she ever created, that they're all very negative. So I thought, well, that's a good way to write. I mean, it's very hard to write positive characters. Yeah. Although people do it, and I have to admire them for it. I had a friend called Laurie Colwin, and she was a, she had an early tragic death, but she wrote books with things like, titles like Happy All the Time. And they would be about people who were happy from one cover to the other. And uh, very strange, I, but beautiful writing. So it is possible. Yeah. Oh, here we have a question. Yes, I'm writing. Uh, the I'm, question was, what is he working on now? He's always working on something. I finished one novel and he's halfway through the next one. Uh, I'm writing a book now called The Humble Lover, which is kind of uh, a little bit icky. I don't think people like it much, but but it's uh, it's about an older man who uh, falls in love with a French Canadian uh, ballet dancer who's 20, and uh, and the ballet dancer, although he is kind of gay, he doesn't fancy the older man at all, but he has this strange quirk, the boy, that he can't sleep alone. And so the older man finds this out through a ballerina, and, uh, and so he invites the boy to sleep beside him every night, but never be touched, just sleep. And, uh, and the boy finds that a wonderful proposal. And uh, so... Uh, that's the way the book begins, but it, it ends with the, the boy falling in love with uh, a woman and, and then the humble lover uh, killing them both. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I can't wait. But they deserve it because they live in an A-frame house. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Okay. Is this question right here? The, sir? Oh, no, I was wrong. <laughs> well, I thank you, Ed. I mean, that well, was thank you. tremendous. Uh, thank you, David.